Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for the webinar on Cancer and Aging, Biological and Phenotypic Measures of Aging. My name is Stephanie and I will be your WebEx host. So before we get started today, I'd like to make a few comments when using WebEx. All lines have been muted upon entry and will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. Please submit through the throughout the presentation in the chat box or the Q&A panel and select host from the drop down list. We will ask these questions on your behalf during the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you need to view live captioning, please refer to the link that will appear in the chat panel. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online at a later date. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Paige Green, who will introduce our speakers for today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the National Cancer Institute's Perspective on Cancer and Aging webinar series. We host this webinar to share our broad interest in cancer and aging research, to honor Arthi Hurria's pioneering and impactful leadership of geriatric oncology, and to feature her legacy as an impassioned clinician, researcher, and mentor. As such, each webinar in the series will showcase complementary research or clinical perspectives by scientific influencers at the tenured and junior academic and clinical level. Today, we are pleased to feature Dr. Luigi Ferrucci and Morgan Levine. Dr. Ferrucci is a geriatrician and epidemiologist researching the biological and phenotypic pathways leading to progressive physical and cognitive decline. He redesigned the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging to interface geroscience with age-related changes in phenotypes. He collaborates extensively, has published more than 1,400 peer-reviewed manuscripts and has the distinction of being one of the most productive scientists by his home nation of Italy. Currently, Dr. Ferrucci is the scientific director of the National Institute on Aging. Dr. Levine is an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology at the Yale School of Medicine and a member of the Yale Combined Program in Computational Biology and Bioinformatics and the Yale Center for Research on Aging. She integrates theories and methods from statistical genetics, computational biology, and mathematical demography to develop biomarkers of aging for humans and animal models using high-dimensional omics data. Clinically, Dr. Levine uses system-level and machine learning approaches to track epigenetic and omics changes with aging and to develop risk stratification measures for cancer and Alzheimer's disease. So without further ado, let's turn it over to Dr. Ferrucci. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's truly a pleasure to be speaking uh, in this uh, virtual symposium. You know, I, 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 I am particularly honored because I knew very well Arti Uria, and uh, she was the force of nature, enamored about science, uh, and I think that she would really like this uh, symposium if she could see, see with us. But I think in spirit, she is with us. Um, I want to try today in a few minutes to give you an example on how part of the study of aging is trying to connect some of the biological methods that explain the aging process with the phenotypic and functional manifestation of aging. And I'm going to start with a slide that is a general paradigm. You know, what we really want to know is to try to prevent the functional and cognitive decline that occurs with aging. So we are really interested in the area of functional aging. Over the year, we have realized that in order to do that, we need to go deeper. And for example, we need to understand how the ability to walk is affected by some of the phenotypes that are typical of aging. For example, the decline of muscle mass and muscle mass. And this has been really the work that has been depicted by the longitudinal studies over the last decades. But um, understanding, you know, muscle is not enough. We really need to understand the mechanism that, that uh, explains such a decline. And so we started to look at molecular mechanisms. And here I you know, list some of the typical marks of aging, you know, the cellular senescence and the nutrient sensing. But today, because I need to be, you know, quick and fast, I'm going to try to concentrate only on one. I'm going to talk mostly about 
how do we connect mitochondrial dysfunction with, uh, you know, the muscle strength and how we connect the muscle strength with the walking disability? And that, why it is important to make this connection? Because once we discover those connections, we know what are the biological mechanisms that we want to influence in order to prevent the decline of physical and cognitive function with aging. Okay. One of the important things that we have learned over the last few years is that, uh, you know, if you had asked me 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, what was the cause of the decline of muscle strength with aging? I would have told you that it's because the muscle mass declined, a change in body composition. And because of this change in body composition and muscle shrinking, also the strength generated by muscle also declined. But we have discovered that this is not completely true, or at least this is not the whole story, because the decline in strength that we see with aging is much more than expected what the decline in mass. These are longitudinal data, and in uh, um, orange, you see the knee extension torque, which is a measure of strength, and in blue, a measure of um, muscle mass that is derived by uh, uh, tomography. And, and, and you can see that, uh, over the different decades, uh, you know, the decline in strength is over and beyond what you can see in terms of the decline. So it means that uh, there is a change in muscle quality. The muscle not only shrink, but it's not on, always the same. Change in uh, characteristic and its ability to generate strength is, is present. So part of the reduction can be explained by these simple slides. These are MRI images of people that I've ordered, uh, you know, by age. And you can see that age from 23 years to 83 years. Uh, and you can see some pattern emerge, you know, that the muscle, yes, shrink a little bit, but not tremendously. But what you see is that there is a structural change, a marmorization of the muscle, an increase uh, in the subcutaneous fat, and an increase also in the fat, uh, the interlace between muscles, especially in some of these individuals. However, you can see that those 83 years old person looks very much like a 26. And I can tell you that this is a guy that uh, swims two miles every day, you know, even during the winter season in LA. And so the effect on the muscle can be to some extent counteracted by physical exercise. So when you think about institutional muscle, the first thing that comes to mind is that there should be some metabolic effect. And so in order to look at this metabolic defect, in collaboration with Louis Model and Elisa Fabri, we did a case control study in the BLSA. They matched individuals that had low and high muscle quality, low muscle quality are in blue, high muscle quality are in red, pairs so that they will not be confounded by any characteristic. And then we collected blood and we can measure metabolomics to understand whether there was some signal of uh, in the blood that will explain this decline of muscle quality. And I'm going to make a very long story, very short, uh, to tell you what uh, the metabolites that seem to be increased uh, in individuals with low muscle quality compared to those with uh, high muscle quality. And with low muscle quality, you see that mostly at the red and the red uh, amino acids. And what is interesting there is that uh, this result is exactly the opposite we were looking for, because we thought, well, no muscle quality will be less protein available for the muscle to grow. But in fact, uh, the reason for this result became very evident when we look within the muscle. Within the muscle, the long brain chain amino acids, the valine, leucine, and isoleucine, were completely the opposite, so were lower in those with low muscle quality, suggesting that there is something that impedes, obstacles uh, those amino acids to enter into the muscle. And biochemically, I, that's the only you know, mechanistic slide I'm going to show you. The not, lack of entry of branching amino acids in the muscle have a lot of important effects. One effect is directly on the Krebs cycle, that is the bulk rate of, the, of what generates um, energy. And then um, also stimulation of SIRT1 that um, 
um, stimulate PGC1 alpha, which is what creates mitochondrial biogenics, but also an effect on mTOR. You know, there are less amino acids. Uh, the mTOR think that you don't have enough bricks to generate more protein, so protein synthesis is somewhat inhibited. But, and so you have a protein protein synthesis. So think about mitochondria and think about protein because we are going to explore this aspect in the next slide. And I'm, I'm sorry if I am trying to, uh, you know, simplify the issue, and I'm happy to go into the detail when we go into question. One of the things that you wanted to do is see, are these mitochondria really not working? And the beauty of mitochondria is you, you can study them in vivo. You can study them in vivo using a technique that's called E31 spectroscopy that uh, use uh, a peculiarity of muscle that energy is accumulating into phosphoreactive. So you make people exercise in the magnet, and then you look at the dynamic of phosphoreactive, but you can see here that uh, during the exercise, the phosphoreactive goes down, and then the mitochondria reconstitute the phosphoreactive, and the dynamic of this curve gives you an idea of what the maximum mitochondria function. When you do that, you see that maximum mitochondrial function, both in men and women, decline with aging. And uh, there is large variability, but the trend is very, very clear and highly significant. And then in the top of this slide, you see that when you look at mitochondrial function, you know, biological microbiology, and something as big as walking speed, you see that there is a strong correlation independent of confounder between mitochondria speed and in the mediation analysis, you can see that there is important mediation by muscle speed. So you see that a biological component, which is the mitochondrial dysfunction, results into a dysfunction at the muscle level, and this dysfunction at the muscle level translates into the inability to work. I want to talk a moment about protein, because I think the study of the protein muscle of the future and this is uh, really a very simplified summarization of two studies that we have done recently and published recently on uh, change in protein that occur with aging and with physical activity. On top, uh, you see that uh, the aging effect is that uh, there is a decline in the protein that belongs to the mitochondria class, but also an expansion of the protein in green that are the protein that uh, the deal with alternative splicing, which is uh, a way by which the genome can, uh, um, you know, generate other protein from a single from, from a single gene. When you look at uh, the effect of uh, uh, exercise, the effect is minimal. It's completely the opposite. So, 75 percent of the protein upregulates from mitochondria, and there is a downregulation very significant of splicing machinery. So I'm going to skip a couple of slides, so I stay in my time. But uh, in order to see whether this was really true, whether splicing was important, what we did was to compare individuals that uh, have, uh, uh, you know, very strong physical activity. These are master athletes uh, that are really winning uh, marathons at the age of 80 or more compared to age match control. And you can see that the, the splicing machinery appeared to be downregulated in this data, suggesting that the downregulation of RNA processes should be essential to maintain strong muscle function. And the final evidence for this is a paper that we just published in Aging Cell suggesting that when you look at the protein in the muscle, in the same muscle when you are looking at mitochondrial dysfunction, you see that uh, here, the three pathways that seem to be dysregulated, uh, with, well, that seem to correlate with better mitochondrial function, independent of age and physical activity, of course, uh, are mitochondrial translation and respiratory transport because they generate energy, but, but, but also the MRA splicing seems to be very, very important. 
The reason for that is still unclear and represent, you know, the frontier of the future. But one of the things that we know happening is that there is a change in how mitochondria connect each other with aging. And I'm going to show you three movies. The first one is this. Uh, the, the, this is a representation from a seed sam and the pink area of mitochondria interlace between sarcolates. And you can see that they create a very complex and very connected network. If you see what's happening in a middle-aged individual, the network is already broken and the representation of mitochondria is much less. And finally, if we look at a male that is uh, much older, you know, there are fragments of this representation of the connection with deposition of some amorphous parameter that we don't really know what it is. And so I think that what's really happening is that the integrity, the structural integrity of mitochondria is lost. The connection between the functional part of the mitochondrial network are lost, and so that the efficiency in the generation of energy and probably also the production of oxidative stress is short. And, and if we're able to measure that, that we will have measure an early predictor of what's happening to muscle later on. And uh, uh, the idea is that if we could understand uh, you know, early, early sign of the functional decline by looking at biological variables, we can actually anticipate the secondary prevention. So do secondary prevention at the time when disease is non manifested itself. Thank you for your attention. And now I'll give you Morgan. That was um, a great introduction from Luigi, and I'm really excited to be presenting to this group today. So um, I'm going to be talking about mostly DNA methylation, which Luigi showed in one of his first slides, the different ways in which we can quantify aging process, either at the functional level, um, the phenotypic or physiological level, and then at the molecular level. So this is focusing more on the molecular level and how changes at that level are associated with both aging, but also um, focusing a little bit on cancer for this specific talk. Um, so when I teach um, sometimes on in the cancer class at Yale, I like to start with this question for a lot of my students. I'm not gonna expect people to answer this, but um, usually ask, you know, what's the biggest risk factor for something like lung cancer? And a lot of people will assume that things like uh, smoking are actually the biggest risk factor, but for most cancers, aging is the biggest risk factor. Um, so smoking increases your risk of developing lung cancer by between 15 and 30 fold. Whereas um, aging, if we compare the, the incidence of someone 25 to 29 years old to someone 75 to 79, it's actually an 800 fold increase in your risk of developing something like lung cancer. And this follows for most of the um, different types of cancer which show this exponential increase as a function of age. And I like to also show this cartoon uh, from the New Yorker, which basically says, you're deliberately putting yourself at risk of ill health by being over 65. Um, and this is not universally true. It, as we'll talk about, people have different rates of aging and different ways in which they age. Um, but the idea is that the aging process is actually thought to play a causal role in the etiology of most major chronic diseases that we study, including cancer. So one important question um, is whether cancer risk or the increase in cancer incidence as a function of age is causal or consequential. So some people um, believe that it's just a function of chronological time. So the more time someone has, the more likely they are to kind of have this bad luck or roll the dice and develop maybe um, mutations that will increase uh, tumor genesis. Um, but this is uh, a model I really like from James De Gregori, which actually shows that aging is probably more causal in uh, the risk for developing cancer. So uh, in the figure for A, this shows kind of the conventional idea that you have these oncogenic events and that this we believe will increase the fitness of that cell and thus increase um, cancer. But actually, um, what James shows is that 
the fitness landscape is actually altered by the age of the tissue. So some of these events, um, if they happen in a young, healthy tissue, will actually not have a fitness advantage, whereas when they're happening in old, um, perhaps damaged tissue, this then gives them a fitness advantage, which is why we see this increase with age. Because if it was really just mutations, um, the interesting thing is that uh, about half the mutations actually occur before full body maturation. So why are we only seeing this exponential increase after perhaps age 40? So really what this comes down to is that context matters and that we think these system level dynamics that change with age are actually altering the fitness landscape. Um, so this is something that we're really interested in studying in my lab. And so one question is, how can we actually understand these systems level changes that are happening in different tissues and cells with age? So for this, um, we work on developing things called biomarkers of aging. So we think of these as useful proxies that estimate the aging or agedness of a sample. So you can think of this as tree rings. So there, is there a way to actually count the age of a sample except tree rings are probably more chronological than biological age. So when we develop these, we think they should answer two questions. The first is probably a much easier one. So biologically, what differentiates the average 20 year old from the average 80 year old? And there are tons of things that do that. Um, it's pretty easy to quantify that. Um, but perhaps more importantly, what differentiates a healthy 80 year old from an unhealthy 80 year old or same thing, a healthy 60 year old from an unhealthy 60 year old? And that's where this becomes a little more complicated is trying to understand this heterogeneity in the aging process. So my lab mostly focuses on DNA methylation, although we also develop other types of biomarkers of aging. But the reason that we're really interested in DNA methylation is we think that epigenetics can, is um, in some ways the molecular operating system of the cell. So specifically DNA methylation is involved in a number of cellular processes from cell proliferation and differentiation, the transcriptional repression, genomic imprinting, and organization of chromatin, just to name a few. Um, and when I'm saying DNA methylation, what I mean is um, methylation of these uh, CPG dinucleotides. So if you look from five prime to three prime end of the genome, you have these CPGs or uh, cytosines followed by guanines and these cytosines can have a covalent attachment of this methyl group, and usually this is associated with repre uh, transcriptional repression. But the really interesting thing is that we actually see very striking age associations in changes in methylation across the genome. Uh, so this volcano plot on the left is showing changes in DNA methylation at about 450,000 CBG sites. This is from brain, so the x-axis is the slope of the change with age, y-axis is the p-value, and as you can see, there's a lot of significant change in methylation with age. The interesting thing is that aging and cancer actually mimic in terms of the types of, of methylation changes we see. So in general, with aging and in cancer, we see increased um, methylation in these promoter regions of genes and decreased methylation uh, genome-wide. So given the precision of the changes in methylation with age, people have actually been able to develop what are called these epigenetic clocks. Some of the most famous um, were developed by Steve Horvath. Um, so the way you can do this is you can take a sample, either blood sample, a tissue sample, saliva sample. Uh, we measure methylation at between about 20,000 to now 850,000 CPGs. And we use different supervised machine learning approaches typically to develop predictors of either chronological age or correlates of aging. So I'll, I'll show a little bit how that's been done. So there's been a number of these epigenetic clocks that have been published. Um, this is not showing all of them, but it's showing some of the main ones that are published. And what we call these first generation epigenetic clocks were developed as age predictors. So they used um, tens to hundreds of thousands of CBG to develop the best predictor of chronological age of a sample, either from blood or multi-tissue. Um, but the different, the issue um, with some of these is that they're, the model are trying to perfectly approximate age. And again, as we know, people differ in the rates of aging, you actually want to have spread um, across that. So the second generation of clocks actually uh, trained predictors of aging correlates. So the idea is to capture what I would call the true residual. So 
where those black arrows are, you, you want the spread to, or the residual to actually be biologically meaningful and to map onto differences in either risk of mortality or risk of age-related diseases. So I'm not going to go too much into the different clocks, but first, just to show kind of how these correlate with age in different tissues. Um, so most of them work fairly well in terms of showing strong age correlations in a variety of different tissues. The interesting thing is that um, some of the ones developed in blood actually show really interesting tissue level differences. So the ones, the tissues that seem to cluster together um, showing a lower slope and intercept actually all come from brain, <laughs> whereas the other ones um, are, are come from non-brain tissues, which is something we're following up on. But in general, even the, the epigenetic clocks developed in blood seem to work across different tissues. Um, but one thing we're also interested in is whether they also differentiate things like normal tissue from uh, tumors. So this is data from breast, colon, lung, pancreas, and thyroid. Um, and as you can see, the two clocks on the right hand of the screen um, are recent clock that's also called the phenoH clock, and also this Yang clock, which is considered mitotic age clock, um, do differentiate the tumor samples, which are on the, the white side, from the normal tissue, which is on the black. So in this case, the tumor is always um, accelerated in terms of its epigenetic age compared to the other whereas the other clocks do not do as good a job at differentiating tumor from normal samples. So another, um, this is preliminary data from a collaboration I have um, where we actually have a normal tissue, normal breast tissue from women who either have breast cancer or those that don't have breast cancer. And what we can actually see is again, um, for our clock, the phenoage clock, an acceleration in the normal breast tissue from women who have had cancer. So one question, going back um, to what I talked about in the beginning, is it that these women have some sort of accelerated aging in this tissue that's then predisposing them to developing cancer? Um, so that's something, again, we're following up with. So another thing that we're really interested in is, you know, what's being captured by these epigenetic clocks. So as I mentioned in the beginning, DNA methylation is good at capturing a lot of different cellular changes. And what we actually think of, that these clocks are composites of a lot of things that are actually happening with aging. But to understand functionally what they're capturing, we need to kind of um, uh, distinguish the different pieces of the clocks and understand which are these shared signals across different aging phenomena and across tissues and how are tissues differing in the different types of uh, epigenetic aging signals. So for this, I'm going to show some of our preliminary data from this. Um, so we were focusing on DNA methylation data from a number of different studies, so whole blood across a wide age range, um, adult brain methylation from dorsolateral lateral prefrontal cortex, developmental brain, which was prenatal all the way up to age 10, uh, dermis and epidermis, uh, cellular senescence, which, which for those of you not familiar with senescence, is basically a cellular state, a non-proliferative cellular state that's also uh, accompanied usually by anti-apoptotic uh, uh, signaling and also increased pro-inflammatory and growth signaling. We also looked at induced platypotent stem cells in reprogramming. And again, compared the same data I showed you before with a tumor versus normal. So the idea here was that we ran principal component analysis in all nine of these data sets. And then we estimated the top 10 PCs from each data set in each of the other data sets. So for instance, in the whole blood, I'd estimate the, principal com the top 10 principal components from dermis, epidermis, <laughs> et cetera. So each of these data sets then has 90 variables which are the PCs across them. So then we looked at whether there's consistent associations with aging or the age-associated outcomes. And for 10 of the PCs, we found consistent age associations in all nine of these data sets. And I'm just going to show you two for an example. So this is one of the principal components that came out of the tumor data. And as you can see, uh, it shows us uh, fairly strong age correlations in whole blood, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex showing kind of this 
uh, super exponential in during development. Also, dermis and epidermis, and it's not labeled here, but in both dermis and epidermis, the light colored dots are from um, regions that have low sun exposure, whereas the dark colored dots are from high sun exposure regions. Um, we should see uh, age correlation in colon. And then from in vitro uh, uh, cell culture, we see uh, near senescent fibroblasts, oncogene induced senescent fibroblasts, and replicative senescent fibroblasts have accelerated. Um, measures for this compared to the early passage. We also see uh, that reprogrammed cells, so induced pluripotent stem cells, also have a, reversion, a reversal of this uh, variable. And also in mesenchymal stem cells, we see replicative senescence uh, show an increase. And then finally, a difference between the tumor and uh, normal tissue across the different tissue types. So this is just to show that we get a very similar picture actually when we're looking at one of the PCs from the other data set. So in this case, it was PC1 from the epidermis data set. So this is basically, to me, it's suggesting that the same patterns that we can pick up when differentiating tumor versus normal, you can also differentiate in, for in this case, epidermis from a multi, from a wide age range group. So just in conclusion, um, you know, one of the main questions is, does biological aging in a tissue actually predispose it to tumor genesis? And this is this idea of, is aging cancer linked just based on probability with time versus aging actually be a causal driver of cancer? Um, and we actually think it's the latter and think that some of what I showed today is preliminary evidence to suggest this. So, um, first, we can estimate aging in these various tissues using DNA methylation. And for most clocks, tissues do show aging. <clears throat> but perhaps more importantly, we can see that tumors seem to have an accelerated rate of aging compared to normal tissues when you use these epigenetic clocks. And also, we can differentiate normal breast tissue from women with a history of breast cancer from controls. And then finally, in some of this preliminary data, which we're further following up in, um, we can see that a lot of these uh, DNA methylation patterns in cancer or in aging apply to other tissues and other phenomena. So the same pattern we see that differentiates tumor versus normal also correlates with age in blood, brain, skin, and colon. It's also accelerated in skin exposed to sun versus that not exposed to sun. And we see accelerated um, epigenetic aging phenomenon in senescent cells that are induced either through oncogene induced or uh, through serial replication. So with that, I just want to acknowledge um, the people in my lab and also my funding um, from various sources. Wonderful. Thank you both so much of having excellent presentations today. Um, as a reminder, if you have any questions that you'd like to submit, we're about to jump into the Q&A portion of the webinar. So you can go ahead and submit your questions into the chat or Q&A box and select host from the drop-down menu. So we do have a few questions that already came in, um, and I'm going to pass that over to Lisa to go ahead and begin. Thank you, Stephanie. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Great. Thank you both for your wonderful presentations. Um, I think this is ex exactly what we wanted to hear from you, from, from both of you today. We do have some questions. For Morgan, how would an investigator choose which clock to measure in a study? Um, so that's a really important question. Uh, we actually are doing a lot to try and figure out which clocks work best for which applications. And I would say there's not one clock that's probably the best across the board. Um, so we actually have a paper under review right now that will hopefully come out that kind of shows how the clocks differ, what each one is best at capturing versus another. Um, but for now, what I would actually suggest is that people use multiple clocks in their studies because it's going to be really informative to figure out which clocks work for which applications. And we're only going to actually be able to figure that out by showing them across a lot of different applications. So for now, I would say, given that you'll have the data that you can estimate multiple clocks in your study, I would say most people should use them simultaneously. 
So I apologize to Dr. Ferrucci, but we're getting a lot of questions about the clocks. So, um, Morgan, uh, Maybe you can probably also answer questions about clocks too. It's yeah. part of a lot. True. So, are there interventions that have been shown to reverse the epigenetic clock? And how um, yeah, so that's really where I think the field is and where it needs to go. Um, there was one paper published uh, with Steve Horvath as part of it where he used a bunch of the clocks and they did do an intervention. Granted, I think it was only nine individuals in the intervention and no control group, but they did show some kind of preliminary evidence that the clocks can be reversed in that manner. but. We, we definitely need a lot more follow up with that. Um, we have some data showing um, using some of the more phenotypic variables that dietary interventions can actually have an impact on um, biological or phenotypic age, which we think should also be reflected in the epigenetic clocks. But that's really where we need to go with this to make sure that these are modifiable. In relation to what you showed for the normal tissue versus the cancer tissue. Can you clarify whether aging in the normal breast tissue of cancer patients occurs in tissue prior to the systematic systemic therapy? You didn't mention treatment in your presentation. Yeah, so, so I believe, I, I would need to verify this, but I believe this was all prior to any treatment. So yeah, this, this wasn't because the women with cancer had received chemotherapy or radiation, it was pre-treatment. Right. You mentioned that age-related changes in methylation were clustered at promoters. Was that true for all tissues? Um, so, so generally, that's a phenomenon we see. The epigenetic clocks are actually not consistent of mostly promoter met methylation. It's actually, um, we have a, actually about the same proportion of promoter methylation or promoter CPGs as you find on the array itself. So we don't necessarily see enrichment for that type of epigenetic change. Um, so, so yeah, in, in that regard, I can't answer specifically because these were specific to promoter methylation. Right. Now, so a lot of people on this, uh, participating in this webinar are interested in cancer survivors and accelerated aging after cancer diagnosis. Have you ever looked at the epigenetic clocks in cancer survivors to see if there's accelerated aging? Um, so I haven't, but I think, you know, that's absolutely a great question. Um, and, you know, the exciting thing about the clocks is you can measure it in multiple tissue or fluid samples. So it'd also be interesting to, to compare other certain tissues or fluids that may be more predisposed to accelerated aging based on treatment as well. But yeah, we, we don't have that data, but I think it would be really informative. If I can contribute to this question, uh, we have studied people that are survivors of cancer to understand uh, some of their characteristics, uh, such as, for example, the fact that they are fatiguing very, very easily, uh, much more than age match individual that did not have cancer. And we are finding that there is a substantial decline of mitochondrial function in this individual. Whether this is due to the cancer itself or is a consequence of chemotherapy is not really clear at this point. We don't have enough data. But there is suggestion that uh, the fatigability and the sense of exhaustion that this individual perceive, even when they're no longer affected by cancer, can be affected by a reduction in mitochondria. So, Dr. Ferrucci, we have a question for you about which aging pathway do you think has the highest potential for clinical intervention and why? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> mitochondrial biogenesis, you know, everything that's related to mitochondrial biogenesis is a very strong. I think that what's happening is that uh, how the cell perceives the presence of energy, and there is a basic protein, which is kinase, the IMP kinase, uh, that really understand whether there is energy to do everything that the cell needs to do. And if there is not enough energy in the cell, make decisions about uh, how to modulate the production of energy and how to use the residual energy. I think that is the one of the basic mechanisms 
and that's why calorie restriction seems to be one of the most effective, uh, you know, in uh, intervention impacting uh, some of the biomarkers of aging. So I, if I had to think about which one is the pathway that is mostly affecting is IMP kinase uh, and mTOR. These are the two, you know, basic uh, bricks that around which most of the aging process, you know, evolves. And Dr. Ferrucci, again, in, in relation to mitochondrial DNA, have, has it been looked at to determine risk of cancer treatment-related toxicity or late effects? And related, do you know if cancer treatment increases mitochondrial DNA age? Well, I, I, I don't know the answer of the specific question. I can tell you that we know now that there is accumulation of somatic mutation in mitochondrial DNA. The accumulation occur in two specific sites, especially the DLU, that is important for the replication of the DNA, and the cytochrome B. And those have consequence because the accumulation of those mutations is being associated with function, you know, walking speed and also muscle strength. Whether this uh, is uh, accumulating at a higher rate in people that uh, receive treatment for cancer, we have not studied, but certainly it's a great question that could be addressed in the future. Is, is it correlated? Has it been looked at in terms of correlation to other biomarkers of aging, such as shortening of telomere length? How well are they correlated? As far as I know, the mitochondrial DNA uh, heteroplasm is not being correlated with that. I, 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 I have not knowledge of that. Yeah, but you know, you're, you're hitting a very, very important point to me. You know, the, we're talking about the whole marks of aging. First of all, it's probably, you know, the list we have is not exhaustive. But is the list we have the truly defining biomarker that are separate each other? It's probably not. They're probably highly connected. I expect that the people that have accelerated methylation age will also have more senescence, will also have, uh, you know, problem in nutrient sensing, will have also, you know, problem in autophagy. And, and that is a good news. And some evidence is actually coming out in the literature. Because the issue is that if we affect one of those hallmarks, are the other going to also follow you know, the beneficial effect that we have on one of them. And, and I think that this is where the science is going, you know, trying to reconnect the network or interaction that occur, you know, between the different hallmarks of aging and understand how they interact and how to maintain the homeostatic mechanism that maintain health. Thank you. That's a, <laughs> that's a lot of work to be done, but a lot of good questions. Dr. Levine, we have several questions about race and ethnicity and epigenetic clocks. Were the epigenetic clocks developed in samples from racially diverse samples? And another question is, are you planning to study epigenetic clocks with regards to race, ethnic population groups? Um, yeah, so the epigenetic clocks, um, I can comment on the one that um, I was a part of developing. So it technically wasn't developed in a racially diverse sample, so it was developed using the Impianti study, which Luigi is a PI on, so an Italian cohort. However, we did make a point of validating it across racially and ethnically diverse groups. So um, we validated it in uh, the Women's Health Initiative with enrichment for racial ethnic minorities, in the Jackson Heart Study, um, and then we also actually have a paper that came out, I think, about a year and a half ago, where we actually look at racial ethnic disparities in terms of life expectancy and see whether um, differences in epigenetic age actually map on to any of those. Um, and generally what we find is that uh, the epigenetic clocks seem to work equally well in the different groups. So what I mean by that is they are correlated with the age in a consistent manner, regardless of which racial ethnic groups we look at, and they also are associated with mortality equally in these different groups. Um, but what we also found is that uh, the epigenetic clock um, that we developed is seems to be accelerated in individuals 
um, who are non-Hispanic Black or who are Hispanic, and that this is actually accounting for some of the increased mortality that we're seeing in these groups. Um, we are not suggesting that this is a genetic difference between racial ethnic groups, but probably um, something to do with socioeconomic status that we need to really tease out to figure out what's going on. So related to the measurement of epigenetic clocks, what kind of archival samples can be used for the assessment of epigenetic clocks and what kind of storage is required for the samples that are used? Um, so basically, if you can get they say 250 to 400 nanograms of DNA out of the sample and it's been stored. I, I mean, methylation, it seems to be actually fairly robust, so you, you don't have to be, have perfect samples. Um, you can usually get some of these epigenetic clocks and they look really good. We've used post-mortem samples. <coughs> I've assessed this in saliva samples, blood samples. Um, we're now doing saliva samples that are being sent through the mail, so they're obviously not being stored in pristine kind of conditions, and they, they, they seem to work pretty well, and it doesn't seem to be that sensitive to these things. But I don't know if well, you can comment on that. He's been more involved in the <laughs> than I have. I think methylation has been studied in mummies, as I know. At, uh, there is at least one small study that was done in mummies, and they were able to detect uh, different by sex and by age. So I think that is pretty robust. Yeah. 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 They're using it, I think, for forensic applications, <laughs> which to me suggests that, yeah, it's pretty stable. So there are a number of questions about the interventions that could reverse the epigenetic clocks r related to what um, the answer that you gave at the beginning of the Q&A session. What specific dietary interventions seem to change the epigenetic clocks? Um, so most of what we can say is from the animal studies. So there are epigenetic clocks in mouse, and now hopefully soon we'll have one out for rat. I, I think I can say that, Luigi. Um, and it, they, just like lifespan interventions, they seem to be responsive to things like caloric restriction. Um, hopefully soon there will be evidence that maybe um, some intermittent type fasting regimens might also be effective in reversing epigenetic age. But again, I think especially in humans, we need more of these rigorous um, intervention studies. And also another question is, you know, most of these studies are assessing this in whole blood. But the question is, are these interventions effective in reversing epigenetic age in other tissues and which tissues are most affected by the interventions um, will also be really important in moving forward. So usually most of what we discuss is for whole blood, but whole blood is not actually, I didn't show this um, from the breast cancer or from the breast, um, normal breast tissue uh, data, we actually don't find that good of correlation between someone's epigenetic age in their whole blood and their epigenetic age in their breast tissue relative to chronological age. So we really need to do this on a tissue by tissue basis as well. There's also a lot of questions about exercise. And the first question is, can exercise increase mitochondrial numbers per muscle cell or enhance function? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that I show you that uh, Exercise is absolutely very effective. And uh, in the study of proteomics that I showed you before, this is not intense exercise. This is the difference between, uh, you know, exercising 10 minutes per day or being sedentary. And already you see that 50% of the protein, mitochondrial protein increase in muscle. You know, I wouldn't say that it's magic. I'm not going to say that reverse aging, but certainly many, many of the you know, problems that occur with aging can be in the muscle reversed by physical activity. We don't know, you know, what is the soft spot. You don't know how much you need to exercise to be optimally. Even small amount of exercise certainly are highly beneficial. And I think that answers the next question. The inverse association of aging with exercise appears strong, but the characterization of physical activity was vague. Is there a threshold volume of exercise? And I think you just answered that as well. Uh, I don't think there is a threshold of exercise. I know that, you know, think about the studies uh, that have been done in bed rest. 
that has to clearly affect mitochondrial function tremendously for a little at uh, one week or two weeks with people that are bad rest in hospital. If you make people exercise, one say walking, you know, 15 minutes per day during those two weeks, almost the entire effect of bad rest is washed out. So I think that exercise is extremely powerful. Of course, if you can exercise more, you gain more. But it's not that uh, between running and walking, there is an enormous difference. Walking is already very, very, very effective counteracting the effect of it. And of course, uh, the, 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 the question is right. You know, we see the decline of um, physical activity with aging, and we see the decline of mitochondrial function. However, I have to tell you that even if you take uh, a cohort of individuals that keep exercising constantly, more than one hour per day, so that you take people that are constantly training, you see that there is a decline of mitochondrial function and there is a decline of mitochondrial mass in longitudinal studies. So it's something about aging that seems to be incontrovertible, but that, that, that certainly, you know, what you see in the observation of study is confounded by lack of Dr. Frucci, we have a question about your muscle strength and thigh study. Have there have there been muscle strength studies in muscles other than the thigh? And if so, which muscles? And did they see the same results? And the second part of that is, have they done similar studies on non-skeletal muscles, such as the heart? <laughs> um, well, so, so, so let's start with the first one. Yes, there is these studies that have been done in different type of muscle. And currently, I've done studies uh, in the calf muscle. Uh, I've done those because uh, I'm much interested in the peripheral artery disease, which is one of the uh, pathologies that I study, you know, more intensively than others. And so you can say that the same thing that you see in the quadriceps or in the vastus lateralis, also you see in, 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 in the calf muscle. There have been also studies that have been done in the upper extremities, but not not so much in depth with aging, but what we know is that if you look at the function of those muscles, the decline with aging is less than what you see in the lower extremity. So that is completely counterintuitive, and it's something that I never completely understood because, uh, you know, walking is the activity that we maintain the most. So you uh -huh. expect the lower extremities will be protected. In fact, upper extremities seem to be more <coughs> protected in terms of the decline of muscle strength with aging. And, and uh, you know, that, that's a very, very peculiar finding that we have not been able to explain. Going back to the epigenetic clocks and the sample issue, this is a follow-up to a question that I asked before to Dr. Levine. Are saliva DNA samples correlated to blood and tissue? Um, so we find that saliva epigenetic age is fairly highly correlated with blood epigenetic age. Um, and I've actually been doing a lot more work recently on trying to get even better correlation between them. Um, but I would say of all the other samples you could get, it's probably the most correlated with blood. And it's probably because it has a lot of leukocyte in a saliva sample. So you're going to get a highly um, correlated um, epigenetic age between them. I think, you know, the question right now is, are they good proxies for some of these tissues that we can't get access to that readily? So we've done a lot of work on epigenetic age in brain and how it relates to Alzheimer's disease neuropathology, but it's not really going to be a useful biomarker if you can't access the tissue. So, you know, in moving forward, it's really going to be important to figure out, are there some of these types of samples that, are, that we can actually get um, that minimally invasively that can proxy more of these hard to reach tissue samples. Um, but to go back to the original question, yes, saliva is fairly highly correlated with blood epigenetic age. What about in bone marrow? Can the epigenetic clock be determined in the bone marrow and which compartment? Um, so I don't know necessarily about which, so we do have some data from bone marrow. I would say, you know, it depends on what the question is. You're not gonna get an accurate age prediction. 
Um, but we do see age changes in the epigenetic age. So we see correlations with chronological age between epigenetic age um, from bone marrow, but um, you're not going to get a good age prediction, I think, for the most part, for most of the clocks. Um, but I don't know as much in terms of which compartment. Um, in understanding more about endpoints, how does epigene epigenetic age compare to other composite endpoints like allostatic load in predicting health outcomes? Um, so I, at Luigi can maybe comment on this as yeah. well. I think this goes back to his first slide that he showed where he had functional age, phenotypic age, molecular age. Um, so the functional age is going to be the closest in terms of proximity to most of these outcomes that we're trying to predict, mortality, um, onset of disease. So it's probably going to be the most predictive. The further you get away from that in terms of getting to molecular age, which is the epigenetics, probably um, they're going to be less informative, although some of them have actually been shown to be highly informative. But I also can let Luigi address this. Question as well. I think that uh, you addressed that very well. The issue is uh, how early you want to make the diagnosis. So you want to make diagnosis of something that is happening uh, when people are still healthy. You know, you want to go to a doctor and say, I'm really feeling well. Is there something that I should do to maintain this status of grace? And uh, if we could have biomarkers that uh, can allow us to understand, uh, you know, in the sea, what's happening, what we can do to avoid those outcomes, that's what really uh, we're missing, we want to accomplish. And those uh, have to be molecular and biological in nature. The other biomarker that you are describing are based on the accumulation of phenotypes. They are highly predictive of outcome, but uh, they are highly predictive when something has already occurred and is clinically detected. So, they are important, but they serve a different type of, you know, function. And I'm going to end. We have two more questions that I'm going to ask. There were a lot of questions that were asked of the audience, and I want to thank everybody for their participation, but I'm going to end with two questions. The first is a timely question about COVID-19 to see if you have any insights. It looks like cancer, regardless of gender, is a causal factor for aging. and can you sh shed any insights why gender seems to be a risk factor for COVID-19 mortality, with men being at higher risk of mortality than women? Um, I don't know if Luigi w wants to add to this too. I mean, it's the same, even I didn't show any of this, but with epigenetic clocks, we do see that on average, females seem to be epigenetically younger than males, at least in, um, with whole blood, um, so it could be something to do. Men are also tend to have higher incidence and prevalence of things like type 2 diabetes, so that might be. We're really interested in the aging component of COVID-19 um, severity, so hopefully we will actually be able to answer some of these questions about why aging seems to be a huge risk factor for mortality or kind of severity of symptoms in COVID-19. But I think for right now, it's just speculation. I mean, so, so, first of all, I think that it's early to make conclusion about there is a really a differential gender difference in mortality. I think that the data that we have are still very low in crude, that, and they show a similar pattern across different countries. For example, in the north in Italy, this is absolutely not true. And, and so I think that before drawing conclusion, I will have to wait. But certainly, you know, it's peculiar the fact that, uh, you know, the mortality is mostly due to cardiovascular disease. You know, the higher mortality, up, as, am I, as high as 3% of the infected occur in 80 years old and older that are affected by cardiovascular comorbidities. And we know that cardiovascular comorbidity is much higher in men and in women. I don't know whether when we adjust for this difference, you know, the mortality in the two gender will be leveling out or not. It's really too early, I think, to draw a conclusion. But the, the good thing that, uh, you know, the scientific community is moving so effectively, so fast, we wanted to collect uh, information because COVID-19, you know, as bad as it is, really, you know, 
I'm an Italian, let me tell you how bad it is. But, but uh, it's also a natural experiment. It's something that we should learn from. You know, who is resilient to the effect of an epidemic like this, and who is not? That will tell you what are the mechanisms of protection that we have, and who has those mechanisms of protection that are more functioning than others. So, so it will tell us about ourselves and our ability to resist the disease and overcome the stress that comes with aging. Well, I think we'll end it on that. Uh, I want to thank you both again for your presentations, and I will turn it back over to Stephanie, who will finish us out. Thank you, Morgan. Like, nice to see you. You too, Regina. Thank you. Thank you both for an excellent presentation and for everyone's participation and sub submitting great questions. Um, if you look at the screen, you can save the date for our next webinar, which will be on September 14th. Um, again, for those that have, that have asked, this recording will be um, live on the Behavioral Research Program website within the coming weeks. Um, so thank you again for your participation today. Have a wonderful day.